Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 751 of the Juice Box Podcast. Jenny Smith and I are back today with another episode of the Bold Beginning series. And today, Jenny and I are going to talk about sending your type ones to school. While you're listening today, don't forget two things. One, Jenny works at integrateddiabetes.com. You can check her out and hire her if you like. And two, nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Always consult a physician before making any changes to your healthcare plan or becoming bold with insulin. If you're a U.S. resident who has type 1 diabetes or is the caregiver of someone with type 1, in fewer than 10 minutes, you could go to t1dexchange.org forward slash juice box and fill out their survey. When you complete the survey, you've helped the podcast, you've helped people living with type 1 diabetes, and you may just have helped yourself. t1dexchange.org forward slash juice box. I hope you're enjoying the Bold Beginnings series. It's not done yet. There's more coming. If you've missed the earlier episodes, you don't even have to listen to them in order. If you don't want to, just go find them. This episode of the Juice Box Podcast is sponsored by Touched by Type 1. Please go learn about my favorite diabetes organization at touchedbytype1.org and find them on Facebook and Instagram while you're at it. This episode of the podcast is also sponsored by InPen from Medtronic Diabetes. Get yourself the insulin pen that gives you much of the functionality of an insulin pump. InPenToday.com. Jennifer, we're back. Yay! Uh, we're going to do, for the Bold Beginning series today, just the very simple uh, headline here, school. Now, I was surprised, and then I thought about it a little bit. There weren't a ton of questions about school. And then I thought, oh, maybe that's because they didn't know the questions to ask. So I started adding more stuff to the list because it hit me pretty quickly. Okay. All right. So what ends up happening? If you hear most people's stories, they're diagnosed and school starts a week from now. It's always, of course. It's always that story, right? Like you don't get the whole right. summer to figure it out or something. It's like. We were or not- it's over a break. Often, right? It's like mm-hmm. somebody comes home for like Thanksgiving break or like the the winter holiday or something. And parents, especially for kids who've just gone to college, their parents are like, you don't look, do you feel okay? See, you know, yeah. and, and there's a new diagnosis and oh, now you get to go back to school two weeks later. Let's figure it all out. <laughs> so anecdotally, I've always believed for like a long time before I started making this podcast, just hearing people's stories and writing about diabetes, that people's lives are very like frenetic. And then Mm -hmm. when you hit a holiday or a vacation or a long weekend, even you slow down enough to look up and go, is there something wrong with that kid? You you, you know what I mean? Right. Mm -hmm. So Right. Well, and I think when kids go away, you also, you miss the everyday visual. Yeah that you usually have of them. So then when they do come back and they look very different, I mean, not just like hair color or how they're dressing now, there's a very visual physical difference. And Mm -hmm. you can say, you didn't look like this when I sent you to school in September. It's the same problem I have is when I'm walking through the house and I'm like, is no one going to notice I've lost five pounds? (laughs) (laughs) And eventually you just go up to somebody, you're like, do you see it? Do you see the five? And they're like, you look exactly the same. (laughs) Thanks a lot. (laughs) <laughs> so Go take a beach vacation and then come back and then be like, see, I do look different, I look right? Different. So, you know, just people say, well, how do we transition back to school? It's a big question. People want to understand about 504 plans, which I think are, I always thought were widely understood, but then I, I just realized I only know about them because of Arden. Um, and so we'll start, but we'll start here. This, okay. per- this person said, it was crazy to me that after diagnosis, I was teaching my daughter's teacher about her care when it was so new to myself, and I didn't really know what I was doing. So I felt like I needed support and resources about transitioning. And she just said, she said, uh, the, the schools can't really do much 
and they don't know anything either. And I will say from my own personal experience, the schools would try to, how do I mean this? Sometimes principals are politicians and it's their job to go, everything's fine. You're going to be fine. Your kid's going to be fine. Leave your kid with us. But they're not used to dealing with diabetes. It's always like, like my, my daughter had a, 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 a principal one time. I swear to you, if you showed up at the front door and the building was on fire and people were jumping out the windows, she would have said, go home. Everything's fine. We've done this before. <laughs> you, you know, it's like, all it, okay. It's all okay. <laughs> She's just glad handing you right into, right into hell, you know? <laughs> so, uh, but when it's diabetes specifically, what I find they like to say is, oh, we had a kid here last year with diabetes or there's, of course. or there's two kids here. And and it it struck me finally. I don't know the management style of these two kids or the level of their health. Like you know, absolutely. That's what I was going to say. And it's a big one that a lot of when parents ask me, how do we approach this? What do we do about it? And that's one of the first things is to make sure that you have structured the needs to your child. Like you said, many schools have had experience, or the nurse has been there long enough that they've had at least one student probably with with type 1 diabetes. Again, the school might have a couple, but your child's plan is your child's plan. Yeah. Just because this other child doesn't seem to need accommodation or assistance with things, their management style is very likely different than what you're doing with your child. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there very well will need to be some instruction. And schools differ. School to school, system to system, private versus public, what they have in terms of resources and allowances. Some nurses travel between schools and they're not always there. So it means establishing somebody that is always at the child's school for the real young kids who may need somebody to check in with um, versus the nurse that's always there. There are so many things that I've heard and seen that I mean, there are thousands of ways that people address the needs. Yeah. And it does really begin with the scenario you're in. I mean, you just said it, but it's, you could be in a school where there's literally no nurse and they're they're telling you like, I don't know if you've ever met Mrs. You know, Smith, she works at the front desk. She's lovely. She'd be happy to give your kid a shot before you're like, okay, who's she? Well, she answers the phone and, you you know, and, and she might end up being a godsend to you. Like, I have no idea. But you have to, you can't run in there and have all these expectations and they don't have the infrastructure to handle it. Correct. Right. And and that, and you can't just force them. What I've learned dealing with schools is that they're just people at work. Like you want to think of them as special somehow because they're a teacher and et cetera, but they're people, they're at their job. They're not look. I mean, imagine if someone came to your job, Jenny, and they were like, hey, this is all the things you do every day. That's great. Here's what else I'd like you to do. Right. This is Billy. Don't let him die. <laughs> You're like, wait, hold on. I don't want that to be my responsibility. And that's what I would run into all the time. I had trouble finding people to be glucagon delegates mm-hmm. because they were like, we, I'm like, listen, if this should happen, if Arden has a seizure, you stick this thing in her butt and push the the plunger and you're going to save And her. that's it. Yeah. And you're going to save and her. And you're going to wait mm-hmm. for 911 and hope and try to keep her from hitting her head on something. Like, you know what I mean? Like, nothing different right. than you would do if a kid needed an EpiPen or, both. oh, no, no, right. no. I don't want to be involved. The, uh, our school nurse had to search the school to find a handful of people who were willing to do who it. Who would do it. Yeah. yeah. And, and, I and I think, oh, yeah. sorry, go no, ahead. I was going to say, I didn't blame them. <laughs> Right. Not at all. And, and you do, I think there are two definite like mindsets that you have to have when you're coming up with a plan for your child. One, a teacher is first a teacher. Mm -hmm. That is what they are there for. They have all of the other students as well. That doesn't mean that the needs of your child are not important, but you do have to understand that there's, there's teaching that needs to happen. There's a purpose for going to school. So then establishing people that can be the check-in person. Many times I've found that it's it's a little bit easier when schools have um, or your child's classroom has a designated like teacher's assistant that's always there. The teacher has the instruction but has the chance to keep teaching where the TA is kind of there to help and assist behind and maybe more the one that you end up teaching more to 
because they've got a little bit more ability to help, right? right? Um, But again, each school, I think the biggest thing to go to first is whoever the head of the administration is, whether it's the principal or whatnot, what are your accommodations? Have you experienced this before? What, What have you seen as protocols? This is what we'd like for our child. This is what we do. This is how we navigate and manage um, and have a plan or an idea already. And again, newly diagnosed, you may not know where to start. And that's where the community is very beneficial. And I've seen many, many plans posted. We've done this for our child or we have these instructional like, you know, decision matrix that if this, then this, and it's very cut and dry and very easy to follow. Um, some teachers and people in the school are very willing to follow the CGM data. Others don't want to do anything other than just respond to an alert mm-hmm. <laughs> message. So again, everything is very different. You kind of have to see what the school can accommodate. Yeah. Um, we had a, a wonderful woman who's like, I have diabetes, I can help. And then we were talking to her and she had type two and, you know, she had never taken insulin before and she was on metformin or something like that. And I was like, oh, sure. uh, your skills are not going to translate here, but thank you very much. But we still, you know, she was willing to listen. And so those are the people and those are the people we taught. And I think that expectations are important, but it's always a seesaw to me. You know, Mm -hmm. it's like, well, I think my kid should have stable blood sugars at school. And then your school might say, look, we're not comfortable bumping a 150 blood sugar for your kid. Like we're not going to do that. We'll, we'll treat over whatever the, the orders from the doctor say. And that's, that's where I'll tell you, there's a simple sentence that you can put in your order from your doctors. If you can get your doctors to write this, um, like I don't, you, you'll word it any way you will, but basically what it says is these are the rules unless the parents say otherwise and then we Correct. and then we defer to the parents and that way you can make help make decisions yes but you still might run into a, a nurse or a, or somebody at the school who's like look there's five kids that have diabetes at this school we don't do this for any of them and somehow they think that's a rule then you, you know right. and and you so the way i always think about it is this school's a long process you're going to be in the same building For a number of years, you might move to another building for a number of years. It's still the same system. These people work with each other. They know each other. You have to find a way to get what you want without being a pariah. You can't be the person that when you walk in the front door, they look up and they go, oh, God, it's Jenny. You you know what I mean? Oh, right. Oh, Oh, yes. She's here. Absolutely. (laughs) Oh, again with this Jenny. You you know, you put the fake smile on your face and like, hi, how are you today? (laughs) When in the back of your mind, you're like, oh, no. These people hate me because because I'm in here going like, you know, I need you to correct a 120 blood sugar because I don't want my kid's blood sugar to be that high. Right. I think that in the end, to break it down, you need... You need to have a plan that you can teach to someone else. Correct. If you're newly diagnosed, I think you need to explain to them, listen, we're just figuring this out. This whole thing is going to be kind of malleable for a little while. Mm-hmm. I'd appreciate it if you could roll with us a little bit. I'm also figuring it out. I think you have to understand. I don't want to say this. I don't mean this poorly, but I, I don't imagine that there are many um nurses who are one minute at the premier children's hospital in the country working in the PICU that wake up one morning and go, you know, I I think I want to be a nurse at a middle school in my town. Like these might be people towards the end of their career. Their training might be older. Who who knows what, what, what the situation is, right? But they're probably not Dr. House is what I'm getting at. You know, (laughs) (laughs) probably not. Yeah. And so they might have ideas in their head that are from a kid they helped Three years 30 ago, thirty years ago, five years ago, twenty years ago. You have no yeah. idea. So you're you're educating yourself. You're educating them along with them. But what I ended up figuring out, and then we'll go to some people's questions. And I know I've said this in different places on the podcast, but it, it belongs here in this episode. For kindergarten, first, second grade, Arden went to the nurse on a schedule. Mm-hmm. There was no. There's no CGM at that point. So she was she was just going, finger testing, sticks. finger sticks, shooting. We had her like broke. I basically broke up the day in a way that I thought it seems unreasonable that she'll be she'll get low 
in these right. gaps of time. And I look back, she never did get low. Of course, mm-hmm. her A1C was like eight. So her, sure. her blood sugars were pretty elevated to begin with. Today's episode of the Juice Box Podcast is sponsored by InPen from Medtronic Diabetes. InPen is an insulin pen that offers some of the functionality that you've come to expect from an insulin pump. I know you're thinking, oh, Scott, please tell me more. Well, I will. Yes, the InPen is a pen, but it also has an application that lives on your smart device. This app shows you your current glucose levels, meal history, dose history, an activity log, glucose history, active insulin remaining, a dosing calculator, and reports that you and your physician can use while you're trying to decide what your next step is. Well, 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 it's not just an insulin pen. Now is it? InPenToday.com. That's where you're going to find out more information and get started. If you're ready to try the InPen, just fill out the form at InPenToday.com. Or do some more reading. There's actually some videos you can check out too about the dosing calculator, the dose reminders, carb counting support, and the digital logbook. So if you want to lighten your diabetes management load, but you're not ready for an insulin pump, InPen is probably right for you. InPenToday.com. InPen also offers 24-hour technical support, hands-on product training, and online educational resources. And here's something else that you'll find at InPenToday.com that is actually very exciting. Now, this offer is for people with commercial insurance, and terms and conditions do apply. But you may pay as little as $35 for the InPen. And that's because Medtronic Diabetes does not want cost to be a roadblock to you getting the therapy you need with InPen. $35. How crazy is that? InPenToday.com. InPen requires a prescription and settings from your healthcare provider. You must use proper settings and follow the instructions as directed, or you could experience high or low glucose levels. For more safety information or to get started today, you can go to InPenToday.com. But you started, I think what you're saying here is that even a couple years in, you were really going off of not only technology that you had, but also a baseline that you could teach that worked easily because it was a structured schedule. And for the newly diagnosed going into a school type setting, I think that's the best that you can really start with is these are the basics that need to be done to keep my child safe and to allow learning. Because that's obviously the reason you're sending your kid there too, is is to learn. Yeah. And if they're getting interrupted all the time because of of alerts and alarms and things that are too aggressive for this point in diagnosis, mm-hmm. it's not helping anybody. Well, and and what ended up happening was I basically spent the time from when Arden was two till she was five figuring out an ebb and flow to the day where she wouldn't get low, and then I sure. sent her to, to kindergarten with that. Um, the school was resistant about some of the things I wanted and they didn't help her, uh, with, mm-hmm. with a couple of things I'll bring up in a second. Um, it happened, we had it set up where she tested, 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 then at lunchtime or snack time, even she'd go to the nurse's office. They would test her, call me, tell me the number, and I would tell them how much insulin to use. Mm-hmm. And then they would send her back on her way and she'd come back and test again. And this would happen before um, it would happen before snack, recess, and lunch, where she'd get tested. And one day, my timer went off for for recess, and no one called me. So I waited a couple of minutes, and I waited a couple more. And I have to tell you, I mean, looking back on it, it was I was in like abject horror at that point. Right. It's just like we haven't talked. Like panic mode. What is going on? You know, is she? Is she? having a problem and they're helping her is like, I don't know. So right. finally I just called the school and I was like, Hey, Scott, y- you didn't call me about Arden. And the woman, the nurse said, Oh my God, Arden. And she slammed down the phone and she was gone. And I was like, <laughs> and you're like, okay, what does this, what does that mean? So I <laughs> right. sat there for a second and I thought, well, now she knows I know, and she knows she seems to know something too. I'll wait. <laughs> 
Right. And she calls back and she goes, hi, Arden's with me. She's fine. And I'm like, okay. Uh, And then they test her. So a little boy came in with a heart issue and had to be put on a monitor. And -hmm. they just forgot Arden. And Arden went right from school. And because the nurse didn't come to get her, she was in kindergarten. She went right out on the playground. So they they plucked Arden with a 50 blood sugar off the top of the monkey bars and brought her inside. And I then went to the school and said, look, this is what I was telling you about. Like, we can't just hope that the nice person in the nurse's office remembers to save Arden's life every day at 1015. Like, you know, like we need to. And then they were more willing to listen to the ideas that I had. Right. When Arden left second grade, maybe one of the luckiest things that ever happened to her was that her teacher and teachers will know this phrase. I don't know what it is, but her teacher wanted to move from second grade to third grade with the kids. Okay. And so she did that. Mm -hmm. She, She taught the kids in second grade, went to third grade. And taught the same group of kids again. That's a nice school that does that. It was that very cool. Not a, fr- not a frequent thing. By the way, that person, that teacher, was at Arden's graduation. Like she showed, Aww. she showed up at her high school graduation and went around and found every one of those kids and took a picture with them. It was very, very nice. Um, but what ended up happening for Arden was we had fr- we had fresh eyes that also knew the past, and Arden was struggling in math. Mm-hmm. So the woman calls me one day and she says. I know why Arden is struggling with math. And I said, why? It's where she is with her blood sugar at that time of day. It's when we sent her to the nurse. So Uh, the math instruction would start. Five minutes into it every day, Arden would get up and quietly leave the room and go to the nurse's office, come back five, seven minutes later, miss the instruction, and then put her head down and try to do the work. Yeah. No one ever noticed. It It just because it was such a part of the day. And it took her a couple of years to rebound and catch up from that because they were still Mm -hmm. moving forward. She had to learn the back stuff. And it was that moment I was like, okay, we're done. And that's if you go to episode four of the podcast, I talk about how I figured out how to text diabetes. And Mm -hmm. Arden has never been to the nurse's office uh, since that that moment. So the last day of the last day of second grade, um, because she contacted us over the summer and told me that. And that's something to navigate too, you know, because some school systems, again, with these plans, you really have to think about how they're written. Mm -hmm. Because if they're not written specific to what you have worked out and is safe with your child to do, texting diabetes, not having to go to the nurse, the nurse is there in case of need or somebody else, but otherwise it's just navigated between you and your child. I would say that that's, that's less common. Um, and it's a, it's kind of a special school or a special written plan that really worked out that way. I've seen much more the, the child has to check in with somebody. And even if your child is very able to do majority Mm -hmm. of what they're doing on their own, because they do it in the summer on their own or on weekends or whatever, you have to kind of almost prove that they can do that before they'll let you not check in with someone. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I very specifically on my end, I don't, I didn't, you know, I was a stay at home parent, so right. I wasn't at a job, but I could make that part of my day. I mean, if right. I don't know how it would work for other people, but it, it, it definitely, it definitely freed her up to move around the building better. It actually helped us fix problems more quickly, right? Like she didn't have to go to the nurse to find out that she was low and get something like we would do it in the room. Right. It's how she started bolusing. Like she would bolus in class before going mm-hmm. to lunch, stuff like that. It's not going to work for everybody, for sure. But it was the way I found to get around this right. stuff that just kept coming up, you know. Yep. Um, and that's, I mean, that's important. Absolutely. I've even seen many comments from parents who have problems with any accommodation mm-hmm. at all. My my teachers won't do that. They don't have time to do that. Your child isn't special. They don't need this kind of accommodation. I mean, I've seen the total opposite in terms of assistance, which obviously is not what you want to walk into either. Right. Well, so. I, what, well, what I would do is every year in the summertime, I'd go and meet with Arden's teacher and I would explain diabetes to them because they're not going to know, right? And so you say things like you don't want their blood sugar to get low. They don't know what that means. No, like, like, no. right? Like, why? 
because when I'm 60, I don't feel well. And when I'm 50, I'm dizzy. But do they know like your brain will shut off when you're 20? Like, I don't know what they know. And and you also want to be able to tell them, listen, this is a real concern and we need to guard against this. Having said that, I don't imagine it's going to happen. But then again, correct. Yeah. A, a, a light doesn't go off on your forehead before you're going to, your blood sugar goes to 35. Like it's just, no. nobody tells you ahead of time, you know? Well, and one thing that does hit from a teacher level, obviously that's their job is to instruct, mm-hmm. right? One thing that really sort of comes across in terms of the importance of glucose and what their job is supposed to be is giving some baseline information about blood sugar level and learning ability. Mm -hmm. Blood sugars here and here outside of this range are going to mean that my child may be fidgety, may not be paying attention, may be causing problems when it's not, it's not what they want to be doing, it's because their blood sugar isn't right. Thus, my kid isn't going to be learning what you're trying to teach them. It's going to be disruptive. So if you help us to keep their blood sugar in this range, you can continue instructing better. My child will keep learning better. And it's a win-win, right? right? That That's a point that often makes sense from the teacher angle is the association between learning ability, attention ability, and glucose levels. Yeah, and I, 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 I shown a light on security, and and health, and I and I told them about long term health too. I said yes, mm-hmm. we because they're like, well, why don't we just leave our blood sugar higher? And I said because, uh, you know, there's there's damage that comes from that too. That it's more long term. I think the way I put it in one meeting one time is I said, listen, if you want to keep Arden's blood sugar at two hundred all day, why don't I just pull her out of school? send her to an island and let her live her life. You, you know, I was like, because right. at least she'll be healthy. Like maybe she won't have an education. She won't know how to like you know, work or help herself. Or she'll know like how that. to pick coconuts, but, but she'll be alive. <laughs> and you know, like that, I'm like, that's not okay either. And they're like, well, I don't understand why this kid. Well, we don't, we don't help this kid until their blood sugar gets to 200. I was like, well, that's their decision. Like, you right. know, it's not okay. And, and you're right. You have to, you kind of have to be both sides of the conversation. You need to yes. get what you need without upsetting anyone. And you have to be helping them. It's a negotiation that you're the only one who cares how it goes. I don't know if that right. makes sense or not. Right. So you, yeah. you almost have to defend the person who you're negotiating with at the same time. I used to put every year I would find something in Arden's 504 plan that we didn't need anymore. And right. I, would, I would give it away at the 504 meeting to make them feel better. I'd be like, we don't hey. need to do this anymore. It's like, you know, you're doing this. You don't need to. Let's make right. this easier for you and get rid of this. And then that, they, we'd leave the room and they'd be like, oh, look what I got today. <laughs> you know? And uh, and and meanwhile, you were never really adding things to 504 plans. You were kind of just manipulating them to make them work for the age range. Like all of a sudden, Correct. like standardized testing. Or the important. technology that you now have. Right, right. Right? Oh, my God, yeah. I mean, as that changes, they're... And especially with the technology that's changing the way that it is right now with all of the FDA-approved products, there is less attention that a teacher or a nurse may need to give. It doesn't mean that they don't need to know how to help in the case that it comes up. Mm -hmm. But this technology can certainly be something to educate them. Well, their system is going to do this. It should be catching these kinds of things. They still need to touch base or they still need to check in with you about this. Um, So, again, those might be the touch points, kind of like you're saying that you don't have to really do as much. They got something here helping, but we still need this and this and this. And in the end, you can set up a 504 plan, um, which is going to give you some legal backing. Like once it's in the 504 plan, they have to do it. But there are you, you do need to understand. Private schools don't need to accept kids no matter what, right? Are they um, immune to that? that? That's an interesting question. I mean, private schools typically have different rules than public schools. And if they don't have accommodations, it often falls to the parent to find the accommodation mm-hmm. so that their child can stay in that private environment. Right. Also, um, and preschools fall into that heading too. 
Yes. Yeah. It's it's might be hard, difficult to find a preschool who's willing to do this for you. Right. Yeah. I, it's, yeah. It is very interesting. Okay. So uh, some other things that I've run into, um, <laughs> no matter what, you're going to get your kid's schedule and they're going to have gym right before or right after lunch. Or lunch. <laughs> and you're mm-hmm. going to be like, come on. <laughs> yeah. So um, a lot of you. But I've got a couple little kids who've got, they've got recess. Then they've got snack time, and then they go to gym class. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's fun. Yay. (laughs) So we'll run it off and then pour it in, then put insulin in, and then have them run some more. (laughs) Yes. Mm -hmm. That's fun stuff. And it's not every day. So you can't even accommodate like an everyday like pattern or something. It's like Tuesdays and Fridays. This Mm. is what happens. I know. I, I actually did have in... One of Arden's accommodations that they couldn't put activity right next to lunch, but it took me a couple of years to get them to agree to that. And yeah. so, and it was hard. I mean, it was hard to get them to do that, to be perfectly honest. I was every year. Well, because it's a manipulation of what the schedule is going to look like for everybody then. Yeah. It doesn't just affect her. Every kid in her class is going to also not be able to have Or you have to put that. her in a class where she doesn't belong to make it work, etc. And in the right. end, I never made them do anything. We always did come to a, an agreement along sure. along the way because I was never looking to be like I, I I mean, I don't know if I was or not, but I was trying very hard not to be like, oh God, here he comes. You know, like I, I don't want to talk to <laughs> Here's this that person. guy. Oh my Hide. God. Like, like when Arden went into high school and the nurse said, um, I actually brought along the nursing staff. So I learned this in elementary. From elementary school to middle school, I brought the nursing staff from the elementary school to my first meeting with the nursing staff from the middle school. That's a great idea. Yeah, because I was like, I'm gonna say I do a bunch of stuff. It's gonna sound crazy to you. And this person right here knows it works. And so right. that, that made the next person. So when I got to the high school, I did it. But the nurse was just like, well, that's not how I do it here. And she pushed back. And she had like a big personality. And she goes, I like having a relationship with all my type 1 students. And I said, well, that sounds lovely. But right. in my m- world, I would love it if my daughter didn't know you. Right. That That's what we're shooting for. Okay. Just like every other kid in the school does not want to end up in the nurse's office. I don't. Right. I, I'm sure you're wonderful. I bet you make it fun for the type ones. <laughs> you know, I was like, but I, that's not our goal here. So she right. pushed. She pushed back and pushed back. And I was like, listen, it's not what we're doing. Like, it's not going to happen. Like, we're going to bring some supplies, and if something gets completely upside down or Arden has to swap a pump or something like that, you'll see her. Right. And that's how it ended up going. And she was okay with that after a while. Mm-hmm. You know, but it took. We had to talk time. about it. We had to take, yeah. had to wait and take time. Nobody ever yelled at each other. That's the other thing. If you're yelling, it's over. Like, like don't don't oh, lose yeah. your don't lose yourself there. I think, um, you know, as we're talking about this, I wonder if I couldn't create a place online where people could upload their five hundred four their plans. That would be, I think, a really great resource. Yeah. I mean, kind of like. Kind of like you have a place online for people to look for um, good endos or good doctors or good educators. That would be a really great resource. Yeah. I wonder if we couldn't just turn them into PDFs and put them so people could look at them. Could look at them. Because Mm -hmm. you, I would even say maybe categorize them like toddler age, like almost Mm -hmm. preschool, you know, grade school, middle school, high school, so that as you filter through them, you can go age appropriate. Yeah for what your accommodation might look like or how it might change. Like you said, you took your nurse along to prove to the next entry level of kind of school age, this is what worked. This is what we did. It is just fine. You know, please accommodate. I'm thinking that because like I'm looking at at a question here. Like, what do I do if my kid wants to skip lunch at school? Like, I don't know how to answer that question. Like, yeah, I mean, I do, but it's it's not something you're going to put in a 504 plan or something like that. And so there's going to be more... There's going to be more scenarios that are really going to be on you to kind of like dance with than just hoping that they'll be in this document and that fixes everything. You know? Right. The document really should be very specific needs. Right. Not what ifs. In, right. In yeah. what if my kid doesn't want his snack in the morning or doesn't want the snack that was packed and prefers the cupcake that came in as the birthday treat? Yes. What if? What? I, you're, yeah. The let five, me know. The 504 <laughs> plan can't incorporate everything that your anxiety no. might put into your head on day, from day to day. Like it, it, it's like Arden's with stuff like 
Um, Arden has a bag with her. It'll have these things in it. If there is an emergency in the school, you need to make sure that bag goes with Arden. And that was when she was younger, right? And then as she got older, the language changed slightly to, like, you can't restrict Arden from taking the bag. You know, once it was on her to remember the bag. Right. Um, You know, if Arden's low, do this, then do this, then call 911. After you've done that, call the parents. Or we had stuff like you have to... Uh, get the school bus driver trained to understand basic like stuff like that. It, yeah, it wasn't like if Arden decides at three p.m. that she wants to X, then you have to like you can't. I know no. that's what people want, but this document's not going to be. It's not everything, you know. It, no. it's, it's just it's um it's the stuff. And you if know anything, that kind of detail may make it very confusing as to the very very real and important things that really should be being done every single day Mm -hmm. the same way. Yeah, right. But little things like as Arden got older, uh, she would write her blood sugar on the top of a test before she started taking it. So she'd look at her CGM and write her blood sugar on the top. And that way, if the test came back crazy wonky, different than you expect her skills to be, Mm -hmm. we could say, hey, look, her blood sugar was high. Maybe you could let her take it again. Right. Um, we'd and with it. a CGM, you could have followed what happened to the blood sugar. You know, maybe blood right. sugar started out fine at 101, but then in test taking, she's not really paying attention and it really starts to dip. Mm-hmm. There too, you could follow that information and be able to go back and say, you know, could we potentially do redo yeah. this? It's funny. So if I if I started this episode over and decided to make it two minutes long, I would say you're in a relationship with these people now. It needs to be harmonious. There might be times where you have to bite your tongue. You don't want to get into a fight with anybody. It's a long process. You might be with them for Mm -hmm. 12 years. um, And there are going to be times they're going to say things that you're like, that's not right. But you got to understand their perspective, too, and make it work somehow. Yeah. It's like being married, except (laughs) I was going to say without the sex. But, you know, if you've been married long (laughs) enough. It's basically <laughs> like being married. That's all. <laughs> yes, there's give and take. Yes, exactly. You give a lot yeah. and somebody takes a lot. <laughs> yes. There you go. <laughs> and, and, if you, and if you're lucky, your kid gets his lunch on time. Um, okay. All right, Jenny. Well, thank you very much. Of course. A huge thank you to Jenny Smith for being here with me again today. And I'd like to remind you that you can hire Jenny at integrateddiabetes.com. I'd also like to thank InPen from Medtronic Diabetes. If you're looking for an insulin pen that does more, you're looking for the InPen. InPenToday.com. In a few moments, I'll tell you a lot about the show, but one of the things I'll tell you is how to find these series. So if you've just stumbled upon this one and you'd like to find the rest, There's a way to do that. I'll be telling you about it in just a second. If you're into helping people, especially people with type 1 diabetes, I'd like to ask you to go to t1dexchange.org forward slash juice box. When you get there, fill out the survey completely and you've helped somebody. All you need to be is a U.S. resident who has type 1 diabetes or is the caregiver of someone with type 1. t1dexchange.org forward slash juice box. Join the registry, complete the survey, help someone with type 1 diabetes, help yourself perhaps, and support the Juice Box podcast. You will do all of this in the fewer than 10 minutes that it will take to go to that link and complete the survey. The survey is very simple. You'll know all the answers to all the questions. It is also HIPAA compliant and completely anonymous. t1dexchange.org forward slash juice box. There are links in the show notes of your podcast player and links at juiceboxpodcast.com to all of the sponsors and to T1D Exchange. When you take the time to click on my links or to type them in a browser, You're telling the sponsors that you came from the Juice Box podcast, and that is a wonderful way to support the show. Are you looking for a vibrant and intelligent community around diabetes? Look no farther than the Facebook page, the private Facebook page 
for the Juice Box Podcast. It's called Juice Box Podcast Type 1 Diabetes. The group has over 28,000 members, and those members are responsible for between 70 and 110 new posts every day on the Facebook page. Every conceivable conversation around diabetes is happening at Juicebox Podcast, Type 1 Diabetes, on Facebook. You're going to see great questions, thoughtful answers, and supportive people. No matter if you're an adult living with Type 1 Diabetes or the caregiver of someone with Type 1, this group is for you. Doesn't matter if you eat low carb or high carb or somewhere in between. Your questions and thoughts are welcome on our Facebook page. I hope you check it out. Last little bit, if you're looking for the Diabetes Pro Tip series or the Defining Diabetes series or any of the other multitude of series that exist within the podcast, you can find them in a number of ways. They are at juiceboxpodcast.com. They are at diabetesprotip.com. And if you belong to the private Facebook group, you can find them listed in the featured tab. Now, if you're enjoying the podcast, please consider sharing it with someone else. That helps the podcast grow more than anything. Word of mouth is definitely how the show has become what it is. If you have already shared it with everybody you can think of, and you've bought an Omnipod or a Dexcom or supported one of the other sponsors, you've done the T1D Exchange survey, and now you're looking for another way to give back to the podcast, super simple, a five-star rating and a thoughtful review in whichever audio app you listen in would be amazing. Thank you so much for listening. I'll be back very soon with another episode of the Juicebox Podcast.